Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming to the New America Foundation. My name is Peter Bergen. Uh, this is a really wonderful event that we're going to have today uh, for uh, remembering uh, Ambassador Holbrook and also uh, the book, The Unquiet American, uh, which I think may be one of the best book titles uh, of all time. Uh, for anybody who knows uh, Ambassador Holbrook. Um, and we have a wonderful uh, panel to uh, talk with us uh, today. Uh, we're going to be uh, starting with Cathy Martin, who was, of course, married to Ambassador Holbrook, who has been a long-term uh, board member of New America, a very, uh, who has been <coughs> essential to New America's growth over the, the past decade. Uh, the author herself of, um, she's just starting on her eighth book, uh, which is going to be a memoir uh, to some degree of her life with Ambassador Holbrook. Um, and uh, after that, we'll uh, hear from Rufus Phillips, who was Ambassador Holbrook's first boss, uh, who uh, went, went to Laos in the uh, mid-50s as a CIA officer, uh, was essential uh, to setting up the civilian um, support program in Vietnam, uh, was an early uh, kind of uh, one of the first people to warn President Kennedy that things were not going uh, quite as everybody, uh, some people were suggesting in Vietnam. Uh, then we'll hear from David Rhodes, who's, uh, and also uh, Rufus Phillips has this wonderful new book, relevant new book, Why Vietnam Matters, which Ambassador Holbrook um, wrote the foreword to. Then we'll hear from David Rhodes, who a uh, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, who uh, knew Ambassador Holbrook uh, both in Bosnia and in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, he'll focus on Bosnia, and then we'll hear from Alexander Evans, who's a British diplomat, who's now a academic at Yale. Uh, in fact, he's uh, both a, an interesting kind of mix of both a diplomat and an academic, uh, who worked for Ambassador Holbrook when he was special representative to a Afghanistan and Pakistan. And finally, from Shama Shamila Chowdhury, who is a senior uh, fellow here at New America, who was also director on the NSC for Afghanistan and Pakistan, and also worked for Ambassador Holbrook. So we have a wonderful we're really looking forward to this. Thank you for every, all of you for coming and doing this. Uh, thank you, Peter. Should, should we speak from, from there yeah, or um, what, is, what is the stand up? Stand up? Oh, okay. <laughs> no uncertain terms. <laughs> well, um, good afternoon. Thank you, Peter, for that wonderful introduction of, of uh, a really uh, superb panel. Thank you for assembling. Uh, I can't think of a, um, a panel more qualified to speak of the many facets uh, of this man. Um, it always takes one minute, and then I'm fine. This has been a, um, a great uh, adventure, putting this book together, because to contain this large figure within, within covers is, is not an easy task, but I think we've come close to doing that. And, and I, I need to thank um, Samantha Power and Derek Chalet, who both have day jobs in the White House for uh, doing this in, in record time and for rounding up writers uh, of the quality of, of David Rode and, and the others, Strobe Talbot, John Alter, um, Roger Cohen, uh, Richard Bernstein, etc. Um, I um, uh, had a had a minimal role. I wrote I wrote the introduction, and I I was kind of a um, a spur. Um, but uh, I just want to say a few words about uh, about the negotiator and um, and the man. Um, Many years ago, uh, before I was married to uh, to Richard, uh, the distinguished New York Times correspondent Richard Bernstein said, "I've only ever met one great man, and that was Richard Holbrook." And I said, "Really? Why is that?" And he said, "Well, because Richard Holbrook is is changing the world." And uh, after uh, after after reading this book and after the terrible year um, that um, since he left. I, um, I agree with that. He did, sorry, he did leave the world a different place than he found it in the following ways. Um, he, um, well, obviously he ended Europe's nastiest war since the Second World War, which in itself is, is, is significant. But uh, he also uh, started Europe's most uh, 
uh, vibrant um, cultural center, um, the, which, which arguably the American Academy in Berlin is. But above all, I, I learned this past year, he changed the world by mentoring. Um, he has uh, left, a le uh, I think his key legacy really, is, is that he left behind a generation of, of, uh, of diplomats, of uh, intelligence agents, CIA agents, humanitarian workers in the field who somehow were, were touched, transformed, inspired by Richard, and, uh, and who will carry on that Holbrookian spirit. And what is that Holbrookian spirit? Well, Richard wa Richard's brand of diplomacy was one human at a time. He was uh, impatient with, with, uh, with, with bureaucracy and with, uh, and with the endless diplomatic um, social uh, niceties. He, Richard was about getting things done and about breaking down barriers between people and between cultures. The way he worked, and Shamayel will tell you more about this, the way he worked the AFPAC case was, was a holistic approach. It was, it was not about diplomacy, it was not about military, it was not about uh, civil society, it was not about building, uh, rebuilding Afghanistan's agriculture, it was not about empowering women, it was about all of that. And that's really, I observed him do that in the Balkans as well. The, the Dayton Accords was not about ending a war, yes it did end a war, but it was also about creating a new society. A new society which, uh, however imperfect, um, can, uh, thrives and 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 has has not reverted to those ancient ethnic hatreds that that it was predicted it would revert to at the first opportunity. Not a shot has been fired in Sarajevo uh, since 1995 uh, in anger. So uh, that that was was Richard's brand of of diplomacy, and he left people to carry it on and. And uh, uh, that, I cannot think of a better legacy f than that. Um, in, um, in recent days, uh, there in, in reviews of the wonderful uh, biography of George Kennan, there have been uh, comparisons made between George Kennan and, and Richard Holbrook. And indeed, they were both singular uh, figures. And, uh, and I suppose in common also, neither one was Secretary of State. Uh, I would like to attack that 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 uh, that bit of conventional wisdom about uh, Richard's thwarted ambition for not becoming Secretary of State. Let me tell you, um, you don't get to be Secretary of State if the people that you back for president don't get to be president. The people that Richard backed as a Democrat were Al Gore, John Kerry, and Hillary Clinton. Um, uh, so it, it's no. It's no mystery that, uh, that none of them uh, became Secretary of State. Uh, Richard was a very old-fashioned public servant. When a, when, when a president called and gave him an assignment, Richard said, I am there, sir. Uh, however impossible that assignment, and the last one was pretty close to impossible. But uh, from what I understand, he's, uh, the, the, the things that are working on the ground there, including now, uh, finally, um, the beginnings of, of negotiations with the Taliban were planted by Richard. So I think he was right to take that mission impossible, and it wouldn't have occurred to me to discourage him from that. Um, the other contrast with Kennan is that, is that Richard was the world's most gregarious human being. George Kennan was, was, was a loner who has often been called a, a misanthrope and an elitist. Richard was the opposite of that. Plus, Richard put human rights centrally in his, his brand of, of diplomacy, which for Kennan, in some ways, a more conventional and a more academic uh, diplomat, human rights did not factor in. So, so I wanted to uh, point that out. I also wanted to um, uh, correct uh, uh, another sort of uh, bit of, bit of um, conventional wisdom, and that is that uh, that, that Richard was um, a kind of a bull in a china shop diplomat. Well, in fact, um, Richard spent a great deal of time cogitating his next move. He calibrated his moves quite precisely 
even for the most part, his famous eruptions were calculated for diplomatic effect. Not always, but, uh, but, but for the most part, he was, he was a disciplined thinker. And last summer, that is the summer before, I saw him when, when, he, when he would go into that think mode where, where he was unreachable, <laughs> where he would kind of space out. I saw him working AFPAC like a Rubik's Cube. And, uh, and I said, what's going on there? And he said, I think I've got it. And I think I see a way to make the pieces fit. And I said, well, that's good news for all of us. Uh, would you care to share that? And he said, no, I think I need to tell the president first. This was September, this was September 2010. And uh, I'm not sure he did get to tell the president, but, but I hope so. Anyway, I am deeply grateful uh, for the New America Foundation on, his, on whose board I proudly serve uh, under the, uh, the um, absolutely inspiring leadership of Steve Cole, who honors us today with his presence. Thanks, Steve, for being here. Steve is just back from, from a great trip and has produced a, an absolutely fascinating and groundbreaking article in the current New Yorker about Mullah Omar that I recommend. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to um, be here with you and to talk about Richard. And after we, we um, uh, hear from the distinguished panel, I, I hope we can exchange in a, in, a, in a conversation and forgive my emotionalism. I'm Hungarian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Rufus is next. Do I introduce Rufus or you can introduce yourself? I'll, I'll introduce myself. Good. Thank you. Well, that's a hard act. Oh. Uh, I think uh, I was Richard's first boss, <laughs> as uh, many of you may know, but not all of you. And I need to set the circumstances uh, uh, under which this occurred. Uh, I had been asked by the Kennedy administration, and I was uh, 32 at the time, to go out and see how the aid program, our economic and social assistance program, could be reorganized in Vietnam to support counterinsurgency. And I, at that time, I was no longer in the military or in the CIA. I was out in the private sector. And <clears throat> so I went out and... What I found was that all of the assistance was concentrated in Saigon, and the aid mission, which had a little over 200 people in it, only three of which were outside of Saigon. Yet the whole insurgency and the whole basic problem in Vietnam was out in the countryside. So the plan that I came up with was essentially to turn the mission upside down, to create a special office to put uh, people out in the provinces who would be uh, USAM provincial representatives working together with the province chief, Vietnamese province chief, and the military advisor, and decentralized funding out there to actually support uh, social and economic development down at the village level. And this was the program that, that uh, Richard walked into. Uh, he came out in May of uh, 1963, and I remember meeting him. Uh, he was this tall, skinny, skinny kid with curly hair who was impressed you as being very bright, but also brash, uh, inquisitive, and so I sent him along with his companion, uh, who also came out uh, at the time, uh, to work with uh, a regional representative we had. The way we set up was a very flat organization in contrast to bureaucratic hierarchies. We had the central headquarters in, in, uh, in Saigon, which was very small, basically. Uh, 
And then we had some regional reps who were not directly in the chain of command. They were there to support the provincial reps. And then we had down about 40 some odd people eventually down at the provincial level. And so I put him with one of the regional reps and we really didn't have much of an orientation program. It was really learned by doing. Well, when he stepped off the plane uh, in Saigon, uh, he got a, a whiff of what this thing was all about because our executive officer went out to greet him and said, the first thing he said was, take off those ties and coats. This is a shirt sleeves outfit. And so they did. Uh, and uh, the funny part of that is that about a week later, they paid an official call on the American embassy. And of course, they went down in shirt sleeves and they got chewed out for not... <laughs> <laughs> not appearing in ties and coats. Anyway, that was a little bit of the, of the spirit of the place. And so he went around and observed what was going on. He obviously learned very rapidly. It turned out that uh, the representative we had in a particular province down in the south was having problems with the province chief. And I tried to go down and straighten it out, but I couldn't, so I yanked him out. And then uh, the thought occurred to me, well, we've got this, this young replacement. He's completely green. But uh, if he's willing to go, I'll send him. So I called him in. And I told him this is a, a difficult problem in a difficult province, in a difficult province, Chief. Do you feel you can hack it? And he said, well, I'll give it one hell of a try. And so I said, well, you're it. And so I sent him down there. And he uh, had to live, like all the provincial reps on the local economy, the whole spirit of this outfit was very much like that of the Peace Corps, except it was in the war zone. And uh, he started, uh, the programs we had had to do with building schools, uh, uh, with uh, self-help projects in, in the hamlets and villages, with, uh, with health. Uh, we helped train hamlet militia for self-defense. There was just a wide range of things that he was involved in, but he did it extremely well. And I'll never forget his coming back uh, to Saigon and giving me a briefing, and it was a straight-on briefing that he thought he was making progress, but he saw a lot of problems. And I think that that kind of honesty was what was reflective of his career throughout the rest of his life. Well, the other thing that I think is interesting is the kind of collegial atmosphere we had in what we call rural affairs. Because uh, not only did we treat everybody was on a first name basis, but we treated our Vietnamese employees as colleagues. And that struck them as something different. And one of the things I'm very proud of is that one of our assistant provincial representatives who was a Vietnamese uh, afterwards, after the fall of Saigon, came to the U.S. and became the first uh, Vietnamese American elected official in the United States, a member of the City Council of Westminster in California. And he uh, ascribed uh, his self-confidence in, in large part to this experience in working in rural affairs. So that was the kind of spirit. And I think that Richard carried that spirit with him throughout the rest of his career. I know that some of us were concerned because we thought maybe he was over ambitious as he rose through the ladder, but I could see that he was ambitious to do something, not ambitious to be somebody. And uh, he talked about that early experience as being in a seminal one. And I think it was in that way, I think it was also in a way that he understood that these kinds of struggles, which are ultimately political in nature, are decided out on the ground. They're not decided in boardrooms somewhere else. And uh, so whenever he went abroad, he would go down to the local level to try to find out what was really going on. And I ran into him, in fact, he invited me to uh, to uh, a dinner for him in, in uh, Kabul. The reason I was in Kabul is a long story, but there I was, I was a volunteer helping the Fair and Free Election Foundation of Afghanistan. 
But he invited me to uh, this dinner, put me at his table, and during a, an emotional speech about what we were trying to do, and then talking about what he had learned from being out in the field, of course, he singled me out. As he would, every time I sat in an audience in which he was talking about something, and that was another, I think, very human quality that he had. Uh, he remembered his friends, he remembered his mentors, and uh, he always kept in touch with them and would recognize them. And this is a quality that doesn't, is not common uh, among a lot of people who, who achieve very high position. So in sum, I think that uh, Richard's life trajectory reflected some of the qualities that we saw early on in him, which became, of course, uh, much grander and, and much more effective over time. And yet there was this human core to him. And I think what he really understood was these kinds of problems that we face in other countries are really about people above everything else. And he was a really a people person. Thank you. Uh, hi, I had the uh, luck of um, covering Richard as a journalist um, in, you know, I would argue his two most difficult diplomatic assignments. I was a reporter for the Christian Science Monitor in Bosnia when he arrived on the scene there, and then uh, when he arrived in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, I was working for the New York Times. Um, I also have a special personal connection with him that I'll describe later. Um, I, I want to, there's a bunch of themes you're going to hear over and over again today, and, and Rufus and Katya have already mentioned them. Um, what was amazing, I think, about uh, Richard was that his diplomacy often was about individuals. Um, he visited Bosnia as a private citizen first, and you may have heard this story, it's in the book. Um, one of the reasons that he was so motivated about doing something with the war was that he actually met um, a man who had survived um, one of the camps uh, that the Serbs had created. It was a Bosnian Muslim. Um, throughout his life, whether it was um, HIV positive women in Africa, um, he would meet individuals that would motivate him to develop pragmatic policies that would help change um, these situations. And the motor in Bosnia was this, this man um, he met. And then Kati talked about a, a moral threat, a, you know, a caring about human rights, and a basic belief that the United States um, could be a force for good in the world. And that's really not in fashion these days. Uh, frankly, post-Iraq, it's um, sort of you know chic, I would say, to think that the US can't do anything positive in the world, and, and isolationism is, is much more accepted now. Um, Richard, I think, opposed that view. We make many mistakes. We need to be much more humble, much more patient, and much more thoughtful about what we do and where we go. But I, um, I think one of the main lessons of this book and of his life is that we, you know, the United States, and, or even as individuals, you, you can do um, good in the world. Um, when Richard arrived in Bosnia in 1995, then uh, working for the Clinton administration, as a reporter, I cannot tell you how hopeless the situation was. Um, it was actually multilateralism at its worst. Um, the head of the UN mission was Yasushi Akashi, um, a very cautious Japanese diplomat. A French general was the military commander of the UN mission, Bernard Janvier, and they were completely opposed um, to the use of force. And, you know, one other area, and, I, and you should feel free to ask questions about this, was, you know, one question is, what was Richard's view on use of force? There's questions, um, Shamila might talk about his view on the surge in Afghanistan. The, the view I had very clearly in Bosnia was that he believed in using military force as a tool to uh, move the parties in any conflict towards a diplomatic resolution. He was not a pacifist uh, completely. He was also not a militarist. He knew that they were all tools to, to come together uh, to hopefully end these, these conflicts. Um, but we can take questions on that later. Um, my personal uh, link to Richard is that I am, in a sense, uh, uh, Ruvis is his former boss. I am, uh, I guess, his favorite hostage. Um, <laughs> I was uh, reporting on uh, what turned out to be the worst massacre in Europe um, in, since World War II, the fall of Srebrenica. Um, I found uh, mass graves outside of the town of Srebrenica. This was a town that the United Nations had promised to protect. 
It had uh, taken away the heavy weapons from the Muslims trying to defend the town, sent in um, several hundred poorly armed Dutch peacekeepers, and then uh, made no effort whatsoever to stop uh, the Bosnian Serb advance on the town. Um, I was had gotten in once to Bosnian Serb territory, found mass graves, and gotten out and written the story. I learned of more mass graves, went in to uh, confirm their existence. I had found survivors who described being taken to these places um, and 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 somehow uh, surviving during the executions. I was arrested on the, at that second mass grave site, and the really personal relationship to. Um, Richard and Kati as well, who at that point in 1995 was the head of the Committee to Protect Journalists, was that uh, after I was detained by the Bosnian Serbs, my family and my editors from the Christian Science Monitor arrived at the Dayton Peace Talks en masse. And I had essentially created this nightmare for Richard, who already had this impossible diplomatic task of uh, ending this war in the Balkans. Um, he and Kati were tireless at pressuring Serbian uh, President Slobodan Milosevic to push the Bosnian Serbs um, to win my release. Um, I was released because of their efforts after only 10 days. I was incredibly lucky. Um, uh, literally, I'll never forget uh, Milosevic's, these very tall Serbian interior ministry uh, troops uh, sweeping into uh, Bosnian Serb territory and picking me up. Um, and whisking me off to, to Belgrade and, and bringing me home. Um, when I got home, my family sort of regaled me with stories of, of Richard's very personal and sort of almost physical diplomacy. Um, he was um, constantly sort of pressuring the Serbs. At that point, I think my they would not acknowledge that they had me, so there was an initial push to get them a phone call from me. Um, and they described how he would sort of um, physically loom over the different Serb, Bosnian Serb representatives um, at the talks. Uh, it was the vice president, a man named Nikola Koljevic. Um, it's, it's difficult to describe it. My uncle describes it better. But Koljevic was playing some sort of game about whether they would call or they would not call. Or, and one of the basic things the Serbs could understand is how could um, Holbrook uh, care so much about one journalist. Um, and um, my uncle describes Richard picking up uh, Koljevic's hat and sort of toying with it in his hands. And it was the combination of that and then and Richard standing over Koljevic, looming over him. And um, it was some sort of veiled threat. You may have been there, but something like, you know, I'll take your hat hostage if you don't, you know, make this phone call happen. And it was all part of this sort of incredible combination of intellect and charm and sort of physicality and tireless energy that he brought um, together, and it worked in my case. Um, he literally uh, told Slobodan Milosevic that he was going to end the peace negotiations, uh, freeze them until I was released, and uh, that was sort of the, the key factor, and so was Kati's effort defending me as a fellow uh, journalist uh, as well. Um, unfortunately, and I can talk about this uh, later, I was kidnapped a second time during Richard's even more difficult assignment of uh, dealing with Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, I was, we were very lucky with the help of an Afghan colleague, I was able to escape from captivity. And I was flown to the um, US base in Bagram, Afghanistan. And I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, um, Richard teased me and sort of gave me a very hard time after the, the uh, Bosnia incident. We were actually uh, sitting in a pew at a friend's wedding. Uh, the summer before I went off to Afghanistan, I got kidnapped, and I promised him it wouldn't happen again. Um, my captors actually, um, the Taliban who had me, took me into the tribal areas of Pakistan, and they Googled me. And I'll never forget, early in January 2009, when I was a prisoner, they announced, your best friends with Richard Holbrook. And I'd never mentioned Holbrook's name intentionally. I didn't want them to, to they have these huge expectations of what they could get from me. Um, and what they had done was Googled us and it Googled me and somehow, and then also seen Holbrook's uh, name in the news as the new uh, special representative to Afghanistan and Pakistan. So when I arrived at Bagram and I was told that Ambassador Holbrook was on the phone and he wants to uh, speak to you immediately, <laughs> I was very nervous about the earful I was about to get um, and that what I had done yet again at his, his at when he already faced such incredible challenges. Um, but instead, he was incredibly kind, and he used um, the seven months I spent with the Haqqanis as an effort to better understand the Taliban. Um, he just asked me questions when I got back to New York, you know, who are the Taliban, you know, why are they fighting, and what do they want? Um, I saw it as an example of maybe potentially Richard Holbrook mellowed over the years, 
in terms of his reaction to the second kidnapping, but it was more a focus of, of his pragmatism. And I, I just want to go back to that, that theme where he, he just, he was looking for solutions. He loved being in the field. He disdained the Washington bureaucracy. He wanted to solve problems. He wanted to do, as Rufus said, and he was also driven by this, this, this morality. Um, and one other thing is that he was, and, and again, in terms of uh, our, our, this, this time we're in now, he was not a partisan. Um, he worked with Republicans. There's a famous incident where he got Jesse Helms to pay, you know, the back dues at the United Nations. Um, if there was a Republican who questioned his actions, he didn't immediately question their intelligence, uh, their morality, or their patriotism. And I think that's something that's sort of sadly lacking from our politics today. Um, and just lastly, looking at the book, which came together beautifully, um, the best writing in it is from Richard himself. I hope younger Americans will see it as a sort of call to public service. I think he showed how much you can achieve as a public servant, um, and he sort of counteracts the, the cynicism I've talked about earlier. And I, um, you know, I just can't thank him enough for everything he did for me, which is not is a, a tiny thing compared to the tremendous contribution he made to so many people around the world and in the United States. Thanks. Well, we moved to the uh, we moved to the two thousands. Uh, I was uh, I'd negotiated a cunning eleven month sabbatical in two thousand nine. Uh, after spending two years as a British diplomat in Pakistan. Uh, and I'd finally figured out how to spend five months first at Yale and then uh, another sort of six months uh, split between Oxford and Paris. And this was going to be my delicious year of uh, writing and recuperating and thinking about the world. Uh, and it was not to be. Uh, barely was I sort of four or five weeks into being at Yale uh, when I got a phone call uh, from somebody who said, uh, I think you need to think about uh, going down to New York and meeting uh, Richard Holbrook, uh, which I then did. And when, uh, when he offered me a position uh, as an advisor in his team at the State Department, uh, the principal reaction I got from people I knew in Washington, I'd worked in Washington before in the late uh, 1990s, was commiseration. Uh, most people uh, leaned across and said, well, we're terribly sorry. It, it's going to be dreadful. Haven't you heard about what a horrible man he is to work for? Uh, he's beastly. Yeah, he's egotistical. Um, he'll demand slavish loyalty. Uh, you really won't enjoy it. You'll have no influence. Um, and it was striking just how negative an awful lot of people were. Uh, what they knew was uh, the, the, the myths about Richard Holbrook. What they didn't know was the man. Uh, and it was striking, too, that one of the people who did know him very well took me aside and said, um, you will have a wonderful time, and this is an important thing to do. Uh, and he said, there's one thing you need to recognize about Richard Holbrook. Uh, everything that's written about him is true. <laughs> and he paused for dramatic effect before repeating one word, everything. Um, and the doomsters were wrong. Uh, and in fact, uh, I worked for him for the final year of his life, and he was never any time unpleasant to me. So the myth of uh, Holbrook the Bruiser uh, is incorrect. I rather like uh, later on coming across a, a Henry Kissinger quote about Holbrook, which I think is quite apt. It sits on my wall at Yale, uh, and it says the following. Uh, Kissinger says, I yell at my staff, but not at negotiators. Richard Holbrook probably is nice to his staff, but yells at the people he negotiates with. Um, and that also was not always true, but uh, I think he uh, reserved uh, most of his bark for people outside the group of people who worked for him, or indeed the group of people who worked with him. There are five things I really deeply admired Richard Holbrook for, and this is after uh, reflecting on uh, the period working in, uh, in the State Department, particularly as a British person. You know, the, the idea that you can bring in a random Brit to join a group of Americans, to also join a group of people who were uh, outsiders. Uh, he was, um, and I think the first thing I admired deeply about him was his intellectual confidence. And that's not just about the ability to uh, think intelligently about the world or about the policy issues you're dealing with. It's also having a confidence to invite external expertise and to have people around you who don't even share your views or each other's views about what policy course to take. And he wasn't frightened about uh, that level of debate, that level of robustness in policy dialogue. And I, I, I think you compare and contrast that to many others who might have the intellectual capacity but wouldn't necessarily have the confidence to deal with that, uh, that kind of level of debate. 
I think the second thing, and this echoes what's already been said, was his commitment to impact. He wasn't just interested in diplomacy for the sake of uh, being a, a once upon a time a nice office in the State Department. Uh, it wasn't a particularly nice office when we were there. Um, he was really interested in what effect would diplomacy have. Um, and he was able, I think, to distinguish between the ritual, uh, the routine, and the real in diplomacy. He knew when routine and ritual had its part to play, but he was very focused on trying to get to the real. How would you actually achieve something? Uh, that did mean him, he was uh, somewhat intolerant, let's say, of uh, bureaucracy, uh, and not always tolerant of uh, some of the ways that people did things because that was a way that people did things at the State Department. I think the third thing is, uh, and this has perhaps not been commented on so much, I think he showed enormous dignity uh, when uh, his critics inside the Beltway uh, found ways to criticise his performance or his views, usually unfairly. And I, I never heard him say anything mean about the people who were saying mean things about him. And that's a, that's a striking note of character, I think. It's pretty difficult if, you're, uh, if your efforts are under attack uh, not to respond in kind, at least in private with the people you work with, if not in public with others as well. I think the other thing was uh, he's a role model for people who want to have a career in public affairs. And I think now teaching students at Yale to think about careers in diplomacy, whether with the United States or with international organizations or other countries, um, the model of a career in which he had such impact is a real kind of, it offers you insights in a way of modeling a career that isn't just based on uh, punching your ticket and getting an identity card to work in a particular bureaucracy. And finally, he had um, what Isaiah Berlin always said was very important in, in any uh, individual, which is he had excellent judgment. And I echo the point about the fact that he cogitated, he did think about things. He, he held his cards to his, close to his chest a lot of times, so he wasn't necessarily going to reveal his game plan for solving uh, the problem of the day or indeed the problem of the job. Um, but he did think deeply about um, how to approach it. I think, moreover, his life demonstrated two truths about US foreign policy. The first is that a revolving door really enriches policy making if it's used in the right way. If you have somebody like Richard who went off and did so many different things, but rather than just doing each thing in and of itself, accumulated the contacts and knowledge and expertise and experiences, and then used that in his subsequent public, uh, public roles. I think the other thing is how weak institutional memory can be in Washington. And that's the negative consequence of a revolving door. And I think having somebody like Richard who was so conscious of the history of US foreign policy and engagement on a range of different issues, the history of US engagement in peace processes in a range of different places, and he was able to bring that knowledge to bear and also recognize when he didn't know, and, and, but know who he could reach out to, whether it was a you know, journalist like, David or other, others he could uh, reach out to. There were, of course, things he wasn't so great at. He wasn't great at suffering bureaucrats. Um, he didn't always have patience for paper warriors uh, or plodders, and uh, that occasionally showed. But I think his strengths massively outweighed those weaknesses. And actually, you want somebody like Richard Holbrook when you're dealing with a problem as complex and as challenging as Afghanistan and Pakistan has been for the United States in recent years. So in conclusion, I think uh, Richard Holbrook was a statesman, not a bureaucrat, and we should celebrate him for that. Um, and I would say at a personal level, I miss him. So I met Richard during his first day as uh, SRAP at the State Department, and he had requested um, a briefing from the Pakistan team and had specifically asked for desk officers to, to participate. Uh, I was one of those desk officers, and this is something that he was known for. He didn't want to talk to the bosses. He wanted to talk to the people who he knew were working on the issues day to day, 24-7, thinking about these things, ready to staff, ready to brief. So I was one of those uh, fortunate or unfortunate folks. Um, and I have to admit, I was nervous. Uh, as Alex mentioned, there are all these stories floating around about him. Um, one I can remember is that he threw a shoe at someone. Everyone knows the story, and I don't know if it's true or not, but 
So, you know, as I was preparing for the briefing, um, you know, I had various colleagues come by my office and say, you know, he threw a shoe at someone. So just be careful. And, you know, every, it, people were scaring us. Um, so I was nervous, but I prepared and I planned and I studied with my colleagues. And, but only when I met him did I realize how much more nervous I should have been. Um, <laughs> he was a very daunting figure, as all of you know. Um, he physically towered above most people. And a casual glance from him was by no means casual. He could see right through you and know exactly what you were thinking and maybe know what you were thinking you know, five steps ahead. Uh, and he always asked the question that you couldn't answer or the question that you didn't want asked. So I thought, okay, I can fight fire with fire. I know how to deal with a person like this. So in the briefing, he asked very provocative questions and I offered provocative answers. And for those of you who don't know, uh, the State Department is not a place where that's exactly discouraged. Um, but it's rarely, it's rarely rewarded there. So Holbrook rewarded me by giving me more work. Uh, I went home that day and I got a call uh, inviting me to participate in another briefing the next day on Pakistan, this time with Secretary Clinton. So I had more homework to do and I was, yet, you know, I was nervous again. Uh, and during the briefing with the Secretary, I found myself speaking up again. I just couldn't help it. There was too much to say about the state of affairs when it came to U.S.-Pakistan relations. And this time around, I was yet again rewarded with more work. Uh, I received an offer the next day to join the Secretary's policy planning staff. And so after, obviously I accepted the position, and after accepting the position, I recalled how Ambassador Holbrook had shot me a huge thumbs up after the briefing. This was essentially his silent approval for speaking up. It had paid off. I had gotten a much better job, and he had clearly set me up. So it was just a matter of being in the right place and the right time with him and he might just change the course of your career or your life. And I thought, you know, to think, he did this with dozens of folks over the course of his career for so many of us, from Vietnam to New York to the Balkans, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and now Washington, D.C. But these moments of opportunity, as we all know, did not come free. There was a huge service fee and a rather hefty one at that. <laughs> So working for him was not very easy, uh, especially on Pakistan. The issues were challenging and working for him was just as challenging. And I think if you look at the AFPAC essays in The Unquiet American, they clearly indicate that he had a full grasp of the challenges that were coming from Pakistan and the failures of US diplomacy in the region well before he had his job as SRAP. And so he had been waiting on the sidelines for so long that when he finally jumped into the ring, he was moving too fast for the bureaucracy to catch up. No idea was revolutionary enough, and no, no approach was ambitious enough. He seemed to be telling us at the, State at the State Department that we simply weren't good enough, and we weren't working hard enough to take on the task at hand. He was saying that Pakistan and Afghanistan was a unique problem set, and it required an even more unique set of solutions, and we had been ignoring that for years. And I think he was right. His public service record on the U.S.-Pakistan relationship specifically tried very hard to offer that unique set of solutions. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to see that through. But given the terrible state of affairs between the two countries right now, I thought it might be useful to revisit two important strategies he deployed in hopes of offering some guidance for the future. First, develop personal relationships with your counterparts at any expense even at the expense of your own patience. Now, this might sound contradictory to Holbrook's style, especially when you look at AFPAC and there's reporting on his difficult relationship with President Karzai. Um, I saw something very different. Time and time again, I saw him throwing himself at people that he knew he was in conflict with or were difficult to work with or simply did not like him. But he knew he had to do it to achieve the broader policy goal. The U.S.-Pakistan relationship today could afford to rebuild some of those personal relationships. Second, take action and responsibility when the policy heads in the wrong direction. A lot of this Richard did behind the scenes, and no one really saw it. He worked tirelessly to troubleshoot the many problems in the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. Um, the, we the government in Pakistan was very weak. The civilians were weak, especially as... Uh, it, 
related to you, you know, helping the United States promote certain issues and interests. Um, one example is the Kerry Luger Berman legislation. Um, this package was intended to be a very historic piece of legislation focused on the Pakistani people, but it became a central conflict between the Pakistani civilians and the military. And for those of you who know the legislation, the military was criticized in the legislation. They felt very threatened by it. There were conditions. Um, and what we saw happen in Pakistan was that the military put the pressure on the civilians in response. So instead of le letting this problem fester in this already very negative space, Richard did something else. Because he knew letting the problem fester would not advance US interests. He worked very closely with the leadership in Pakistan, uh, talked with Foreign Minister Qureshi, um, who took an emergency trip to Washington to iron out the details with the State Department and Congress so that he could take something more palatable back to his government. Now, some may call this meddling. Um, it's not our business. This is a domestic issue. But I call this cleaning up your mess. And some of it belonged to others. It wasn't all Richard's mess. But he, had, he felt a strong sense of responsibility to fix this particular issue because if he didn't, it would affect all these other issues that were important to the United States. So criticisms of the legislation aside, it eventually did stabilize the situation. And I think this is um, particularly important now. Um, it's a huge, stark contrast to this past November's NATO strike, where neither the US nor Pakistan have yet to give a clear statement on the situation. The conflict has dragged out even in until this week when the Pakistani government has denounced the official U.S. findings and the U.S. has yet to formally apologize for the deaths of 24 Pakistani soldiers. And I, do, I don't think Richard would be surprised by the current state of affairs. He already knew uh, when he worked on, there's an essay in the Unquiet American um, in the Washington Post from 2006, um, the one on Afghanistan, the long road ahead. He, he knew when he wrote that, that the United States would be in Afghanistan for a long time. And a large part of that was because of the enormous crisis in US relations with Pakistan. And even though President Obama has announced an initial drawdown of troops in Afghanistan, we still don't know for sure how long we will be in the region, nor how to truly address the Pakistan problem. So hopefully we all have a little bit of Holbrook left in us, those of us that still work on US-Pakistan relations, um, so we can start fixing this very important relationship. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we'll open it uh, to questions. And uh, if you have a question, just uh, wait for the mic. Where is the microphone? Uh, oh. Maybe we don't yeah, even okay. okay. Maybe Go ahead. Okay. I have a general question about the differences in the roles in Secretary of State versus State Ambassadors and what circumstances does one supersede the other or, if possible, come into conflict with different approaches to the same problem? Um, do, do you want uh, okay. uh, um, I'm happy to answer it. I yeah. Think it's a, um, the Secretary of State is the boss. Uh, the diplomats, the ambassadors work for the Secretary of State. So there's a very clear hierarchy. Once, once the policy is set by the Secretary, by who uh, ultimately gets, who ultimately collaborates with the President and the National Security Council, um, the, the ambassadors uh, carry, carry out that, that policy. Um, Obviously, personal relationships are enormously important, and in, in the specific case of, uh, of Richard, he had a very close relationship with, uh, with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. So there was, um, there was a great deal of, uh, of collaboration between the two of them. Uh, I think I think uh, Hillary had much to do with uh, with Richard getting this this job, which was arguably um, President Obama's most challenging diplomatic assignment, uh, which he gave to a man he didn't have any personal relation prior personal relationship to. So, but but the the Secretary of State uh, is is ultimately the boss. <laughs> Your hand for in the back, Jennifer. 
If you could just identify yourself and your affiliation, that would be great. Thank you. I'm Zach Pagowski from the United Nations Information Center, and I will direct my question to Ms. Martin. Uh, ha what was the attitude of <coughs> Mr. Holbrook towards the United Nations, and how satisfied was he serving uh, as an ambassador in the United Nations? Uh, Richard considered the United Nations absolutely indispensable to the world, and considered it uh, an imperfect organization as how could it not be imperfect when when uh, it's only as strong as its 193, I believe now, uh, member states want it to be. Um, he um, absolutely loved his, his two years as ambassador and uh, considered it probably the most fun he ever had in, in, in public service. Um, we, um, we, we had a great time. We, we visited 15 African nations um, on, one, on a single trip, and it was during that trip that, uh, that, that Richard was struck by, by the um, unbelievable tragedy of HIV AIDS and then succeeded upon returning to the Security Council in, in making a health issue um, uh, an agenda issue for the Security Council for the first time, and that has radically altered the way the UN deals with uh, HIV to this day, and has had much to do with with um, with turning that that uh, epidemic around. So it was it was a it was a, a great run. He also got. Um, um, as 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 David mentioned, he also got uh, the arch enemy of the United Nations, um, the Re Republican Senator Jesse Helms, to, um, to come to the UN and, to, um, and, and ultimately to, uh, to, to pay $900 million in, in uh, back dues that the U.S. shamefully owed the UN. So it was, again, as, as so often it, uh, with Richard, it was, a, it was a brief period, but an intense period, and, and one that was, that was really f uh, focused on, on achieving very concrete results in a, in a very short time. And that was kind of Richard's specialty. <laughs> My name is Tara McKelvey, and I'm a correspondent for Newsweek and the Daily Beast. And I wanted to ask you, um, I remember I was in Pakistan around the time after the floods, and Richard Holbrook was very excited about the possibility of building U.S.-Pakistan relations from the development work that was being done. I want to know if you could tell me what he was worried about, um, about Pakistan, what he talked about, you know, in the past year. Um, so maybe that will give us some indication of what to look forward or not to dread. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have a mild constraint, which is I'm still a serving British official, so which means I can say nothing in particular, but say it extraordinarily well. Um, but um, but I think I think on Pakistan, I mean. I, I think what was interesting about his approach to Pakistan was, A, his curiosity. I mean, he was really interested in understanding not just Pakistan as it is now, but Pakistan as it was, and, and the sort of successive debates about the U.S.-Pakistan relationship and about democracy in Pakistan. Um, I think he emphasized, um, on the positive side, obviously things like responding to the floods, but also this, this, this intimate, personalized diplomacy with Pakistan's civilian leaders, as well as the military. He was pragmatic about the role of the army in Pakistan. He realized that the army in Pakistan was a presence, an, an institutional presence that was perhaps outsized. Um, but he was also very uh, emphatic about the relationship needed to be with civilians and the civilian leadership in Pakistan. I, I think he shared the same worries about Pakistan that everybody has in Washington. But he was, he was conscious of the need to actually have a substantive dialogue in private with the Pakistanis. And that actually private diplomacy, rather than megaphone diplomacy, might not solve all the problems with Pakistan, but it, it did at least allow you to have a substantive policy discussion that could perhaps lead to resolution in time. Just to piggyback off of what Alex said, because I am free to speak. I've left the US government, so. <laughs> um, 
Richard used to describe the relationship with Pakistan as uh, two sets of issues. Um, there are issues that are above the waterline and below the waterline, and you have to focus on both of them. And they, if done well and correctly, they reinforce each other. What does that mean? So all of the issues that are kind of above the waterline are development issues and responding to crises day to day, um, aid legislation. These were all things that he knew were important um, because the relationship was important for other reasons as well. <coughs> the issues below the waterline, which were predominantly security issues, counterterrorism, um, the need for Pakistan's cooperation um, on U.S. interests in Afghanistan, and you couldn't have one without the other. You, you couldn't feasibly ask for Pakistani cooperation on al-Qaeda and fighting the Taliban if you didn't address uh, the strategic interests of the country writ large. And I think that was the right approach, and that will continue to be the right approach, whether we're able to actually implement that and move forward within the time frame uh, that is beneficial to U.S. interests or Pakistani interests, I think that remains a question. Uh, but you, I think he, I mean, he was well before his time on this one. And I think it's because, and you, you see it in the book, he had been thinking about these issues for so long, years before, uh, and he was able to identify the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities um, on American diplomacy in Pakistan and in the region um, and where we needed to focus on. And that's why when he came in, he was, he came in so strongly uh, on the relationship side of things. I mean, I used to you sit in his office and he would call 10 different people all at once while he was having two meetings with us and you know, two separate meetings in the office, you know, and uh, calling President Zardari or talking to the ambassador or, uh, you know, calling General Petraeus in Afghanistan and some Pakistan-related issue. I mean, this was his way of managing a very complex set of issues that were above and below this waterline. Now, in the absence of somebody doing that, it's very hard to manage this type of relationship. Um, and sometimes you don't have that type of person, you know, and you're lucky if you do. And I think when Richard passed away, we really saw it, it was a unique set of problems requiring a unique set of solutions, but it also requires a unique interlocutor, and that's who he was indeed. Uh, and those of us that work on these issues on U.S. Pakistan relations, it requires a lot of patience and it requires a long-term approach. And he had that, ironically enough, for somebody who a lot of us thought was not patient and was everything was urgent for him. I think he had that forward-looking vision, which you need with a country like Pakistan, and I would argue with a region like South Asia. So, I I, I just wanted. That, that was beautifully expressed, and I, I just want to say that, uh, that Richard treated people with dignity. Um, he did not believe in, in, uh, in humiliating people. He believed that every culture deserved to be treated with, with dignity, and he, um, he felt that, of course, Pakistan was, was a, a, a troubling and troublesome ally, but, uh, but that we had no choice but to, but to be intensely engaged. And uh, you, don't, you don't pick your, your, uh, your friends in the field. To, uh, you, you, you are dealt a certain set of, set of cards, and you have to work them. And I know that, uh, that the day after um, the bin Laden assassination, Richard would have been on a plane to Pakistan. And uh, he, he would have been all over that country and, and, and working the, the it, he knew everybody uh, up and down the, the chain of command. And, and he, he would have uh, been intensely refocused on that. You don't, you don't wait for a crisis before uh, you present yourself. You, you, you preempt that, that crisis by, by uh, personal dealings. And plus, he also didn't want Pakistan to feel that, that it was a transactional relationship. He wanted the Pakistanis to feel, as, as he once put it to me, that there was marriage at the end of courtship, that, that this was not about a one-night stand. In other words, we were, we were, it was a friendship of equals, even if it wasn't. <laughs>
Um, I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Farah Ifshahani, uh, who is a uh, distinguished um, member of parliament in Pakistan and also the spokesman for, uh, for President Zadari and also the wife of uh, Ambassador Hussein Akhani, uh, who is now, of course, uh, in Pakistan because of the so-called Memogate controversy. And Farah, go ahead. If you had any kind of comments or observations. Um, I just want to say that what everyone here has said about Richard, um, as a member of the Pakistani parliament, um, I had the honor and privilege of knowing Ambassador Holbrook at the Pakistani end as a member of President Zardari's team. And I also knew him here in Washington as Hussein Haqqani's wife. And Ambassador Holbrook typified all that was grandest about America and his, his entire process, his way of dealing with Pakistan and wanting to bring a better relationship between those two is missed and felt painfully, I believe, in my personal view, on both sides. No disrespect to anybody in their current positions, but Richard broke all boundaries. And um, he really did historic things, and I was lucky enough to see a lot of that up close. And he and his entire team really made a difference, and I think the history books will reflect that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeremy Harrington. I'm a graduate of the Fletcher School. Um, I'm wondering about the panelists' recollections of Mr. Holbrook's views on U.S. policy during the Vietnam conflict, uh, where he saw the lessons learned, the mistakes, the missed opportunities, um, and how those views evolved during the conflict and the lessons he took in its aftermath. I apologize for not reading his introduction to Mr. Phillips' book uh, to kind of preface this question, but I'm sure there are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, conversations that took place privately over the years. Richard had, I think, developed a pretty complex view of, uh, of the, the, the old Vietnam situation. Uh, he understood uh, pretty quickly that once we became so directly involved uh, with U.S. troops that uh, this was a situation that was not going to work out. That if there was any chance that the South Vietnamese could have pulled themselves together and, and uh, develop something in South Vietnam that the South Vietnamese people really supported and were worth fighting for, that was one situation. But uh, when we had essentially taken over the war, I think, uh, I think he saw that uh, it was a situation that was not going to end well. Uh, he did everything he could to try to focus uh, our attention and efforts in Vietnam on what was called the pacification side of the, the, uh, the, the, the effort, rather than to try to defeat the North Vietnamese militarily, which of course was an impossible task. Uh, I think that he probably would have agreed uh, with an observation, although I never uh, heard him say this exactly, that Maxwell Taylor made uh, at, towards the end of his life, and that was that uh, we were in a situation in which we didn't understand the enemy, we didn't understand our South Vietnamese allies, and we didn't understand ourselves, and by that, our own limitations. Thank you. Um, my name is Akhmal Aldawi. I'm an Afghan journalist working with Voice of America. Um, we talked about the negotiator, and I was uh, in Afghanistan by the time Richard Holbrook was a special envoy for Afghanistan. He didn't talk to Taliban, really. I mean, 
while he was negotiating somehow for the peace in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I remember he had one of the most difficult relationship with President Karzai, particularly during the presidential election that were marred with fraud and other irregularities. Um, I'm wondering if you have any reflections on his position, um, difficult position with Karzai, and being unable to talk to one side of the con conflict uh, was the Taliban. Um, in Afghanistan, also people were saying at that time that there was no actually diplomacy ongoing in regards to Taliban. Petraeus was the commander of ISAF, and, and, and that by then the military logic was predominant. Um, and in a way that wasn't leaving yet enough room for diplomacy to be part of the, the process, if you have any reflections on that. Thank you. You know, I mean, just for what it's, uh, you know, I, I think that what we're seeing today with the Taliban establishing the office in Qatar, and uh, I mean, right from the beginning, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, or Shamila, or, or Caddy, um, you know, one of the first things that Richard Holbrook did, even before he became special representative, was to bring Barney Rubin, who is arguably the world's greatest expert on Afghanistan. Um, I was part of a task force uh, at the Asia Society, even before uh, Ambassador Holbrook was appointed um, special representative. And he was doing a lot of thinking about how to deal with the Taliban. And Barney Rubin is still the point person, as far as I can tell, uh, for, and obviously much of this is, you know, uh, for very good reasons, isn't widely advertised. Um, Barney has been absolutely essential uh, to the effort to bring not just the Taliban into the negotiations, but people who can deal with the Taliban. I mean, a lot of the problems that we've been having with this negotiation, we don't even know, uh, and we, we have a better sense now, perhaps, but who, are the, who exactly are, are we negotiating with isn't very clear sometimes. I mean, for instance, uh, somebody called Mullah Mansour, who turned out to be a shopkeeper from Quetta, uh, was presenting himself as the number two in the Taliban. Uh, well, I think that sort of speaks for itself. So there was part of the problem was trying to identify the people uh, in the Taliban uh, that might actually speak for Mullah Omar, and I think to some degree that has been sort of solved. But I think Richard was instrumental in laying the foundations for this process. Um, now, you know, how the process will pan, you know, develop over time, I think is, you know, we don't know. It took 30 years for the IRA to come to an agreement with the British, and in a sense, this is a much more complex, uh, uh, you know, conflict. Uh, but I think, uh, so I think, Brit I mean, Alex, you and Shamila should chime in, but I, I, my impression very strongly is that uh, this was, you know, one of, one of Richard's, uh, Ambassador Holbrook's legacies was what we're beginning to see, the germs of some kind of negotiation today. I mean, all I would add very briefly is I, I, I can't comment on the relationship with uh, President Ahmed Karzai, but, but I think you know, he was very clear from early on that you, know, you, you require a political settlement in Afghanistan and a political settlement that involves regional partners. And I think he was very clear, to that, you know, very clear about that vision. I, I think connecting back to the uh, Vietnam analogy, he was he repeatedly, I think, at pains to say that Afghanistan is not Vietnam. You know, this is not a direct analogue, because I think sometimes people are tempted to see echoes of uh, US foreign policy past in the present. But he was very interested in what lessons could you learn from the experience of Vietnam. And, and certainly one of those lessons, it seemed to be, that political processes take a lot of time and they take a lot of preparation. And I think you know, that, that sort of echoes Peter's comments and, and comments that have been made in the book and, and by Katy and elsewhere, that, that you know, this, was a, this was all about the preparation for a political process, and hopefully we end up with a political process that yields a result. I just want to add something uh, about Hamid Karzai, because Ambassador Holbrook told me in, in great detail, rather directly, you know, a rather critical scene with Hamid Karzai, which took place as the very flawed election was happening. And he and Ambassador Eikenbury went to Karzai, and basically Karzai was saying, I've won. Uh, or, and this was, or not all the returns had come in, and, and Ambassador Holbrook said, well, what if you don't get, you know, I mean, what if it's below 50%? And Karzai said, well, the, 
you know, I, I already know it's 54%. And he said, how do you know? Because not all the returns have come in. <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, Ambassador Holbrook was very, very insistent with Karzai that, um, you know, basically not only would it be, he, he would be in contravention of his own constitution, uh, but essentially the whole American project and the whole allied project in Afghanistan would go south if he didn't sort of recognize the fact that there would have to be a runoff election. He was very, very firm with Karzai on this point. And of course, Karzai was quite resistant, but when it came to it, uh, uh, you know, Hamid Karzai did say, well, you know, yeah, well, we, we, we'll have to go to the runoff election. And as it happens, it never went to the runoff because Dr. Abdullah, who was the number two uh, candidate, uh, basically stepped aside. But I think part of the uh, kind of you know, the reason that there was tension between Hamid Karzai and Ambassador Holbrook was because there were reasons for the tension. It wasn't just that it was a difficult relationship, but there was a sort of substantive reason, uh, I think, that uh, that was at the heart of this. Um, and Caddy, I don't know if you have not um, I would just like to ask which um, envoy or foreign minister has an easy relationship with Hamid Karzai? Um, I... Perhaps. <laughs> and if I can just add, um, Richard Holbrook was following the policy of his superiors. Um, when he was sort of tough with Karzai on the election, he had clear instructions from Washington to do that. There was a um, belief, I think, at a higher level of the administration that there was a need to get tough with Karzai, that the Bush administration wasn't tough enough. Um, it wasn't. This is one of those, again, those stories that somehow he's too abrasive. That, that wasn't what happened, and he wasn't super abrasive in that meeting. There were media accounts afterwards that exaggerated the level of the conflict. And in terms of negotiations, you know, it's my understanding he supported negotiations all along. He was skeptical of the surge. Um, he believed in a surge, probably not one as large as it turned out to be. Um, but in higher level officials um, did not want to begin negotiations in 2009. They wanted to let the military um, effort play itself out. And he played his um, cards very close to his chest. And, you know, he advised Secretary Clinton and the president when he could. And um, he followed orders. And, and that doesn't fit the stereotype, but I think that's true. I, I'll just say one thing on the reconciliation issue. Um, before Richard came to the State Department, there was probably some discussion on reconciliation and the concept of talking to the Taliban, but it was not, you could say it wasn't socially acceptable or politically palatable. We just weren't there. And no one was willing or wanted to or ready to sell that concept. And so we saw it happening right before, you know, we knew he was coming, but right before he started his job, this discussion started actually internally in the government and it had never happened before and it slowly became part of our psyche where, whereas before it never had been. And what I think Richard was trying to do was to sell this concept internally um, just like you have to sell any kind of war or any kind of political resolution or process. He, I think this was one of his main objectives in taking this job was maybe he wasn't going to be the negotiator but this was to him an acceptable piece and we had to go there. The timing for that maybe, who knows? And these things do take a long time as Peter said. And even now we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't think that we're done. This could take 10 years, it could take 15 years, no one knows. But I, I would credit him with um, socializing at least the U.S. bureaucracy on this concept. If it didn't translate when he went overseas, I think that's because of taking orders or following directives from his superiors. So, uh, I'd like to comment on something. Uh, I think, uh, well, I'll just recount, and, and this is an anecdote. The uh, last time I saw Richard was at a dinner uh, for uh, someone who had been out in Saigon, and it was held at the press club, and there were a lot of press people who had been out in Vietnam. So during the dinner, we, you know, it was all chit-chat and recollections and a lot of funny stuff about what happened during Vietnam. But as we got up to go, uh, I went up to him, and I said to him, I said, 
Richard, does anybody at the top of this administration understand how long this is going to take? And he said, he looked at me and he thought for a moment and he said, they're going to learn the hard way. And so, you know, he was a realist and uh, he'd gone through it with the North Vietnamese in Paris and uh, he understood uh, how long these things take with a very, very difficult opponent and with a essentially sort of vastly unglued uh, situation in the country, you know, that you're, you're trying to get into the negotiation process on both sides. So that's just a side comment. But We have about five minutes, so let's just maybe collect some questions and we'll let everybody. Uh, so Jennifer, if you just collect, we'll just. Uh, hi, my name is Dennis Grubb and I'm an ex-Peace Corps volunteer. And part of Richard's curricula is being the Peace Corps director in, in Morocco in the 60s after he finished in Vietnam as a pacification officer. And I'm wondering whether or not he recounted any of those stories about the Peace Corps to um, the, the panel. Because the pictures I love of, of Richard Holbrook are, you know, sleeves rolled up, as you say, uh, you know, just plogging, slogging along wherever. And um, that reminds me of my Peace Corps days. So I wondered if he had re recollected uh, stories to you all. Great. And uh, just behind. Um, my name's Jonathan Morgenstein, and uh, I kind of growing up it was in my late high school, college years during the Balkans, and I always found inspiration since then in Holbrook's work. Um, my question is, if any of you can recall in the last few years him looking back and saying, I wish I had done this differently at Dayton, or is this you know, lo looking at Bosnia and, and Kosovo and how it turned out, maybe we we didn't fully finish the job and there's something else we could have done uh, either at Dayton or since then. Thank you. Great. Behind you, Jennifer. Oh, the Aberdeen, I came to know Richard in the last 10 years. And he struck me as being a hybrid between Brzezinski and Kissinger. One thing, Kissinger, I mean, Dick did, he traveled to the Gulf, to places like Abu Dhabi and Qatar, and he got the Abu Dhabians to really commit large resources for Pakistan and Afghanistan. And it was due to the skill, to the astuteness, to his great mind, that I think people should realize that his involvement was not just Afghanistan, Pakistan. He traveled, he spent lots of time. Kerry, I'd just like to ask you a question from knowing Richard. He was one of the first American experts who began to question the policy on Iraq within two months. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, good question. And then here in front. Um, I'm Stefan Brathwaite with the Brown University Alumni Club of Washington, D.C. Um, I'd like to thank you all for such touching remarks and um, assure you, Katya, that the many in the Brown community share a sense of loss for, for Ambassador Holbrook's incredible service. Um, my question touches on a different geographic zone, which is um, Germany. I'm interested in any reflections you may have concerning the, um, his role with the Academy in Berlin. Thank you. <laughs> Many of those seem to be directed for you. Yeah, uh, there's, there's one. I think. Or, uh, or are we running out of time? We're kind of. One more. One more, okay. One more. Great. It's all in back then, no affiliation. Richard Holbrook leaves a rich legacy of accomplishments and a rich model for the good public servant. Is there some way to institutionalize this model mm. and his attributes? Mm. Well, these are all these are all great questions, and um, and I can't thank you enough for for your your um, continued um, interest and and your continued um, 
memories and keeping keeping him alive and the panel um, particularly has been has been extraordinary um, I was coming from um, a, a, the first meeting this morning of the American Academy in Berlin Holbrook Center and so this has been a, a, a day drenched in, in, in Richard's memory so difficult but I, but I feel that uh, some of you share uh, the loss, and that um, that's very it's it's very helpful to me. But this is a a, a difficult day. Um, on the subject of um, Morocco and the Peace Corps, he kept that very much uh, alive, and in fact took all of us, the family, on a uh, Peace Corps uh, kind of uh, nostalgia tour several Christmases ago, and we drove across the Atlas Mountains. And you know what? Even today, uh, there are people in the souk in Marrakesh who remember him. He's a, he was a great uh, bargainer. So we went into places and came back with, you know, I could open a Moroccan bazaar from all the stuff that he, he negotiated uh, for, for us. So the Peace Corps was very important. And in fact, there is, a, um, there is an, an, an effort to, uh, to, I don't know if you're aware of this, to, to give um, a prize a whole, um, uh, in, in his memory for, for um, someone who is serving in that uh, Mold on on uh, it's wonderful to see you, old friend. And on the subject of Iraq, uh, Richard was absolutely appalled by the by the reckless execution of that war. Um, he was in favor uh, of uh, not not Richard, of course, uh, unlike um, Bush administration senior officials, uh, Rumsfeld, Powell, Cheney, obviously, and the president, uh, was not privy to, to intel intelligence. Uh, however, he felt that Saddam Hussein was, was a, a true monster and, um, and a, one of the great human rights violators of our time. So therefore, he was not opposed to deposing him for on, on that score, but he was appalled at the arrogant lack of uh, preparation for the post-war period. And um, really, uh, that was, that was very, a very painful time for him because he was um, outside the, the government, unable to serve, and watching this uh, disaster unfold because of arrogance and lack of preparation. Um, let's see, uh, what, what, am I, what am I missing here? Um, Brown University, that was oh, lovely. But, oh, Bos Bosnia, yes, regret, regret for Bosnia. Um, I think he regretted that, um, uh, that he agreed to the name, the use of the name Republica, Republica Srpska, because that was so uh, resonant with nationalism and, and, and a backward policy as opposed to healing and nationalism. But under the circumstances, and, with, and, and I was with him uh, for much of the negotiation, there were so many players, and you were dealing with some of the worst people in, in the world. And to get them to agree to anything uh, was not a foregone conclusion by any means. There were a number of times during those talks when it, was, when, when it looked like um, nothing would, would come of them. And, um, and in fact, the night before the, uh, the agreement was struck, uh, Richard uh, uh, instructed all of us to pack our bags because we were leaving. And, um, and that was, and, and you know, within minutes, bags were outside the American delegation's rooms and the Serbs uh, who were the, actually it, was the, it wasn't the Serbs who were the, the recalcitrant um, ones at, at, at the last. Milosevic wanted a deal. It was, it was the Bosnians who were, who were the holdouts. But there were so many pieces. It was, I cannot tell you the complexity of, uh, of those talks and, and, uh, and how uh, they were being written every night. Um, you know the, the the legal papers, the the uh, drawing up the boundaries, the um, drawing up the you know, uh, how how the, how the how this new tripartite parliament would work. It was it was much more than than just getting everybody to uh, 
to lay their weapons down. It was building a nation under very intense circumstances. And uh, I think he was, well, I'm happy to say that I did go to Sarajevo with him the year before he died for the first time. And wow, that was something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to our panel, to, to Rufus Phillips, David Rode, Alexander Evans, Shamila Chowdhury, and to Caddy Martin. Thanks. Thank you.